Brothers and sisters, I mentioned before that dua has an effect on qadr. Qadr means Allah's predestiny. There's pre something written that's going to happen to you in a negative way. Rasul says the hadith is in Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, and Tabarani, and classed as good and reliable. He said, Nothing can increase in your lifespan except for goodness and kindness to those who are around you. Your parents, your siblings, your children, your spouse, your neighbors, animals, everything. Bir, goodness in general. And nothing can prevent bad qadr, calamities, calamities, except for dua. And then he said, the qada and dua, the predestiny that Allah has sent down, and the dua will continue to wrestle between the earth and the heavens. And he also said, sallallahu alayhi wa the dua will benefit you with things that have come down or haven't, meaning of any bad, any calamity, any destiny that was supposed to happen to you, bad, you know, things that are not so good, they're meant to happen to you. He says, dua will benefit you with things that have happened, that are happening to you now, the hardship you're going through now, and the hardships that have not yet reached you, meaning in the future. So dua benefits you for what you're going through now and what you may go through in the future. How? He said, calamities will come down and your dua will meet it. And they will continue to fight until the day of judgment. And the hadith is rawahu hakim and authenticated by Sheikh al-Albani. How does the dua change qadr? Calamities of qadr. In two, well, qadr is two types. Pre-measurement, pre-destiny, fate that Allah has written, it's going to happen to you, is two types. Number one, there is a qadr that is set, unchangeable. It's written and it's set. Nothing can change. That's the first type of qadr. The second type of qadr Allah writes, it is preserved in his knowledge, but it is changeable. It's suspended, the mu'allaq, suspended. Suspended by what? Suspended by your dua. Allah tells the angels, this is the qadr that's going to happen to them. When the day comes that the angels have to carry out that qadr, Allah says, my servant has made dua. And I had another qadr that was going to overcome it because of their dua. I made it because of the dua. Now take this dua, take this qadr towards them. Example, if there was, God forbid, a calamity to befall one of you, that you're going to go to work or school and get, God forbid, run over by a car. And say the qadr was that two legs will be broken, two arms will be broken, a fracture in the head, unconsciousness, and so on. But Allah knew that you're going to make a dua. And that dua, you made it with full heartedness. And it was very strong. And it ended up being so strong that the qadr, that qadr and that dua met halfway. Then either a new, then a new qadr will come in. Either you will cross earlier or later and the car won't run you over. Or the dua is a bit weak. Say that you have some earnings in haram. Say that when you said it, you weren't very strong and your heart wasn't present too much, then the calamity may fall and maybe one leg will be broken instead of everything else. So it'll be diminished or maybe a fear or maybe something else. So brothers and sisters, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He calls us to constantly make dua. Why? Because it's your attachment to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Furthermore, brothers and sisters, now of course these are not my words. These are the words of unanimously agreed by the scholars, the traditional scholars, not me. I'm not giving my opinion here. Don't be afraid to make your desire in your dua great and a lot. Some people, they feel, oh, I've got, got, got to reserve my dua. I've got to have some respect for Allah. I shouldn't ask for a lot. Actually, brothers and sisters, it's the opposite. Make dua for a lot. And I'll tell you why. The Prophet Sallallahu said the Hadith of Sahih Muslim. If one of you makes a dua, do not say, do not say, Oh Allah, forgive me if you will. Ighfir li in shit. Oh Allah, forgive me if you will. I hear it sometimes and we all make that mistake. I used to do it too. When I say to you, 
May Allah reward you, insha'Allah, brother. You shouldn't say, insha'Allah. Why? Because you're decreasing and diminishing something which Allah has made very vast. Don't say, insha'Allah. Say, may Allah reward you. May Allah heal you. May Allah give you. Oh Allah, forgive me. Don't say, insha'Allah. The only time you say inshallah is that if you're going to do something in the future, say inshallah if Allah wills. So he said, don't say, oh Allah, forgive me in shit if you will. But say with full conviction and with strength, with what you want. And then he said, let him or her gratify and make big what he desires. Make it big, don't make it small. For Allah, for to Allah, nothing is too big for him. Now be careful. There's a difference between saying nothing is too big for him and nothing is impossible for him. Some people, they say, to Allah, everything's possible. Yes, but Allah has also made laws in this world that there are things that he made impossible and he won't give you. So for example, if I say to you, you can make dua that Allah never makes you die. Is that possible? That's impossible. So there are things that are possible and impossible. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, this is what he said to us. He also said, oh my, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh my slaves, O oh my worshippers, if all of you from beginning to end, human and jinn, stood together in a giant single plane, and you all asked me at the same time, each one of you asked me for something, I can give you each one of you your request and it will not decrease anything from my kingdom as much as what would decrease from the ocean if you dipped a sewing needle into it. Put the sewing needle in the Pacific Ocean and then lift the sewing needle. How much of the ocean decreased? Nothing. There was a story I heard it from one of the scholars. He says, that the scholars narrated the story of a man who was once standing in front of the Kaaba and he had a friend with him going on Hajj and Umrah with him. The man stood in front of the Kaaba, lifted his hands up and said, Oh Allah, give me five million, give me five million. He wants fulus, five million dollars. His friend taps him and he says to him, be humble, ask for one million. The guy looks at him and goes, what are you talking about? I'm not asking it from you. Allah is vast and generous. I'm asking from Allah, not from you. Sure, one million. I want to ask him for five million. I'll even ask him for 10 million. Ask Allah for as much as you want, my brothers and sisters. The companions, well, I'll tell you this hadith is in Bukhari. It's beautiful. He said, no Muslim supplicates a single supplication. So long as it is not a supplication to cut off a family tie or for something sinful, except that Allah will grant it to him or her in one of three ways. Number one, immediately as it is. If not, number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ward off, will stop something bad that was going to happen to you equal to what you asked for. And if he doesn't do that, number three, he will preserve your dua for the hereafter to give it to you.